I think that maybe one way just, this isn't necessarily a way into it, but a, a way to sort of preface the conversation. Because I think that we're probably like-minded in this room, like tend to be sort of, uh, I think politically like-minded. Um, but I, I think it's worth sort of saying up front that like this, the, when a book deals with political subjects, it's very possible that we might not be. And that it's worth being, uh, sort of not assuming that everyone thinks alike. Um, just because like this has so much to do with, ultimately has so much to do with the Trump election and maybe, maybe we all agree about Trump. Um, and I think, but I, I think probably a more civil conversation would be had if we don't necessarily assume that and make that assumption and sort of uh, respect potential differences in political opinion. Um, and it could very well be that we're all like, fuck Trump. Um, but if we're not, then it's, I think it's worth sort of <clears throat> Assuming that someone in here is, views it differently and um, is worth respecting that. Uh, yeah, like. <laughs> well, uh, to, to that point, Jeff, should we just kind of like uh, get that out of the way? I don't know. I, maybe, maybe like, well, yeah, I think, that, I think that it's, it's possible to do that and just say like, do we all like agree? Um, but I think also maybe, like one way of doing it, another way of doing it is not, is by I'm like sort of instituting a, like a civil conversation that assumes that people have a diversity of opinions and, uh, and so like, and that we're like sh shooting to respect that. And we can, I think like, does anyone in, is anyone in here a giant Trump lover? Yes. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it, Jenna. I knew it. I knew it. Like I knew it. Out the closet at last. <gasps> no, I, Ju Juniper like is closet. Yeah. Juniper is here to make America great again. Yeah. yeah. I think it was like, she I, she loves cops. Um, you know she. Well, that was I, was, I was going with make androgyny great again, but I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, then I can see how you could be mm. confused. <laughs> Well, you know, under, gay under the Biden way. administration, everyone will be forced to be androgynous. Yeah, I heard they're taking away gender, so that's yeah, good. fewer forest fires. Well, I you'll, get, you'll get a newer government gender? issue gender. Will they give me money newer. for it. Um, no, I think anyway. Anyway, the I, I think more it's it's the uh, a matter of respecting um, the possibility of different opinions. Um, when we have, when we bring up political stuff and also, you know, it goes the other way too, that like, we want everyone to respect our opinion. So, um, that said, I, I do believe that we're all, we're probably not going to offend anyone here. So, um, <clears throat> but I guess, I don't know, uh, I think the, maybe the place to get started because I think the book sort of changes over the course of the book. Um, but let's, I guess we'll, we, let's do what we've always done and start out by going around and, uh, and giving our scores and, uh, and explaining why, one through 10. Um, how, do we want to just do it based on what's on my screen? Pick a person, Jeff, and then they I'll will do it pick based a person. on my screen. Uh, yes. Juniper. Uh, okay. Um, I, I'm giving an incomplete uh, about I'm 75% of the way through the book. Um, and so far it's, I'm really enjoying it in the way that I enjoy memoirs and struggling with it in the way that I struggle with memoirs. Um, and um, which puts it at like a seven, five, eight kind of in that it's in, it's one of the better memoirs I've read, um, especially for, um, uh, that focuses so much on identity politics. Um, I feel like those can really get bogged down in, in an unfortunate way. And I feel like this is kind of being more intelligent and rising ab above some of the fray. Um, so um, right now it's like an eight. Um, 
and and we'll see how the the back quarter finishes out. But um, I'm I'm enjoying it so far. Um, can we get Oliver? All right. Um, also, I will just say really quick. Um, if you've gotten through seventy five percent of it, um, you you can pretty much extrapolate what what the remaining twenty five percent is. It's not radically different. Um, but uh, so yeah, no, I I really enjoyed it. Um, I think for me, it's like a solid 8.5. Um, you know, I thought it was uh, very well done. I do have some complaints about it, um, particularly uh, with some of the more visual elements of it, um, which are pretty limited, um, in my opinion. But, you know, I, I thought it was very well done. Um, there's, you know... A lot of humor in it um like they do kind of play around with the format and do some you know uh mira jacob she does some some really good jokes with that um so so overall i really i really enjoyed it um keith i'll give it a 7.5 uh, i think it did a really good job of like you know kind of speaking to what uh jeff was talking about just like couching it as, you know I'm very much in line with her politics, but it's like, uh, you know, she's like saying like, this is what I was feeling at that time. And it's okay to feel you know, other stuff. You know, I mean, it felt like it, it was never, it was never didactic and like being like, you know, these are all the reasons you should think this. She was like, these are all the reasons I felt this at that time. And I felt like it really did a good job of that. Um, and I thought that the stories were really great. Right, most of them. Um, some of the, I feel like more could have been done with the artwork, you know, this, like, especially like these are just like stock photos. Um, I feel like that was kind of a, a bit of a missed opportunity you know, to do more. I, I don't know. Maybe it just it, it didn't, you know, um, it's not that bad. It's just like, you could, I felt like more could have been done. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I enjoyed reading it. I'm really glad I got to. Loose. I didn't finish it. Part of it is just like I'm having trouble finishing media lately anyway. Um, it's really unmotivated this week. And the other part was like the art didn't grab me enough. Like, I still want to read it later at some point. So I'll just give it an incomplete grade for right now. But. Yeah, it seems like a quick read though, and so an easy to read. But I was just really let down. I was like, "Oh, this is all of the art. It's not just part of the book." Okay. Yeah. Um. I hope you said Jolie because it cut out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will give this book a seven. Uh, it, it did really. It did a really good thing about it. Do you know what it there there's one thing that I liked and that also bothered me, which was it made me feel feelings again that I didn't think that I would feel again. Um and it was very emptying to feel mm. them. So it was a hard thing to get through. And um it also gave me um language to deal with some of the things that I'm still dealing with, which was nice. So yeah. Sorry, Jade, like, I know it's, like, maybe a future conversation, but, like, like what, like, what feelings, like, what specifically are you? Oh, um, almost her whole experience growing up in school. So it's, like, um, it's her experience, uh, the things that she's navigating as, like, a woman and a woman who is a person of color, and also someone who, um, has to not has to deal with, but has to also help or wants to also be helpful um, for people who, you know, are not marginalized mm -hmm. to help them find a the language to deal with it because of my own upbringing, which was like, I grew up in a Swiss uh, Mennonite community. So it's like, I, you know what I mean? Like the whole, uh, to be specific, the whole thing about where he, where she grew, grew up, thinking that it was not okay if you were not white mm -hmm. that that was like a thing um and 
saying things like you don't see color, even though you are a person of color. Um, like it's not, it's not okay to be colorblind or there's other ways of being colorblind that, um, uh, that allow racism to exist. And it was just like, it's like every immigrant book it's it's like every every first gen kid who ever wrote a book i'm always going to read it and i'm always going to cry because their ex their experience is not it may sound unique to someone who's never experienced it but there are thousands of other kids who experienced this who didn't write that book or who didn't write a book about it and who are just like uh who feel seen okay 7.5 I'm done. Um, Patrick. <laughs> um, I, I guess I will start with uh, seven. Um, I really liked the content of it. I thought she conveyed a story very well and with a lot of humor that I, I found myself kind of laughing a lot in several places. Um, which is funny because Sean read it too, but he can't be here, but he was kind of aghast like, why would you think that was funny? But I'm like, I, it was funny. Like, I think she was intentionally being funny. Like, it was really funny. Um, but uh, like some folks, I have some misgivings about the art, which may change in the course of this conversation. And like, I think throughout, like, I just kept thinking, like, this would be so much better in a different format. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, and it also made me think about whether, like, is, if this is her, is this her usual sort of palette in her work? Or is this, like, a thing that she sort of dipped her toes into? But anyway, that's something we can talk about later. Um, Mike Prime, I don't think you've gone. Thanks, Patrick. Um, probably, um, I'd say a nine. I really enjoyed the book I thought it was really well written um, personally I'm really looking for to read more books like this you know white male me and Jeff you know and Oliver and Keith but I, I am I'm so out of touch with the marginalized people that you know Julia you were referring to I don't know many um, to me it was an empathetic experience I mean I I've had experiences where I felt like I haven't gotten the respect that I should have, I guess, but nothing to this level. So it was just uh, a really good experience for me to read the book and to think about white privilege and all that comes with it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I, Michael said, or Mike L said that he hadn't read the book. I don't know if he's still listening or, or not. Uh, yeah, I'm listening, but I haven't read the book, so I'm not going to comment. Sorry, guys. Mike L is the, the specter that's haunting Nerdy Book Club tonight. Right. I think that was everybody, right? <clears throat> I, I didn't give my score. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. <clears throat> um, well, I'm, I guess I'm probably predictable since I nominated it, but um, I mean, I, I really loved it. I, I, I read it two years ago or whenever it came out. I read it partly because I was at AWP, which is the creative writing um, conference, like the major sort of academic conference for creative writing. And she was on a panel about graphic novels and, and it was really interesting to hear her talk. So I immediately went out and bought her book and read it and loved it at the time and have now loved it. And it felt to me like it was important. Like it was a, a, a good book to read right now um, for lots of different reasons. Um, but I loved it then. And I don't know whether it's quite a 10, but it's pretty close. Like, I liked it the first time I read it a lot, and I liked it a lot the second time I read it too. Um, so, and I don't know whether I'm gonna be able to make an, a convincing argument for the art, 
but I actually think that the art is really, really great. And it, I knew that I knew, I knew that the art was going to be a sticking point because it's clearly, she's making a really strong, like a, a stylistic choice that is like not everyone's cup of tea. Um, but we can talk about that more. So I, I really like the art. I give it a, an, I'll give it a 9.5. Probably not, a, not a, like a perfect book, but, um, but it's up there for me. Um, <clears throat> how, you, uh, how you describe the book, Jeff, is uh, also how women describe me. Not quite a 10, but, you know, pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a stylistic choice. <laughs> it certainly is. That's what um, for everyone. In my defense, I have never described Oliver that way. <laughs> Fine, there's one woman that hasn't. <laughs> Fine, two, two. <laughs> I dare you to find a third. <laughs> um, should we should we jump straight into the art, or or do we want to talk about the the other elements first? I think well, why not? Let's let's get let's. We always talk like s substance and content first, and then we go to art as like an afterthought. But the the art is such an important part of this. Um, like why not go first? And it is a graphic novel book club. So like why don't we get that out of the way? Like everyone, people, everyone is bothered by. It. Like, a lot of people seem to be bothered by it. Or say I like the art. I'm with you, Jeff. Yeah. Why? Can anyone express why they're bothered by it? I don't think "bothered" is the right word. Per you feel se. like it's not living up to it's, like it's not doing enough. No, I guess it's more like I need more to come to a proper assessment of the art. I guess, like I'll say, um, six of one, half a dozen of another. It's like you know this. This is a really compelling story, and maybe it was the only way she could get this story done. You know, she's she's doing it herself, so you know it's better to have it done than to like you know worry about it being perfect. But the you know, on the other hand, it's like like I said, I feel like just these static images in front of stock photos. You know, I might not even ha care that much about the static images, because it does a lot to help you follow the characters, but then like, you know, characters get muzzled together, like they're very explicitly different people, but the same image. Yeah. And then the background images, like, you know, in a perfect world, they would all mean, or not, all, maybe not all of them, but there'd be more meaning in a lot more of them. So. Like, I, I guess for me, it's more, um like i i didn't feel like the style took advantage of the medium in mm -hmm. a way yeah. that it, that other people maybe would have been able to um and i kept and this is like if i like the art it, the, but it, throughout reading it which i enjoyed like i just kept going like this feels like a tv show should it be a tv show like i feel like it should um so i i'm not like it seems like it's to me any like it's not the best fit for the medium, um, and then thirdly, and I know this is like a purely aesthetic thing because I think with art there's sort of like that aesthetic element. Like it didn't just sort, of, it just didn't pull me in in that kind of like wow. Like I I like looking at this. Like I would look at it repeatedly. Um, I think it did its job. Like I I think like the compositions and the backgrounds like did a job of conveying and telling the story and the feeling and emotions that she wanted to convey. Um, but for me, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't hook me in that kind of aesthetic level, which does feel kind of shallow, but I feel like that's a lot for art, which is a very aesthetic kind of a thing. Well, so for, for me, sorry, were you about to say something, Lucy? Anyway, I, I thought someone was about to say something. Anyway, um, so for me, uh, I, I thought like the overall kind of visual style was actually good. Um, like I liked it. Um, 
Now there was, um, so w- Jeff, what was that, that other graphic novel that you had recommended in the past for book club one soul, I think was that yeah, the yeah. one? So I, I remember when we did, when we did that book, um, I remember you saying that one of the things that kind of drew you to it um, was that it was something where it was kind of uniquely suited to that medium. Um, now this book by comparison mm. is not really that way. Um, it's not particularly suited, um, to, um, the format of comic books, but I also don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, I don't think that every comic book necessarily has to be the kind of story that you can only tell through comic books. And I did like the visual style. It had this kind of like very sort of lo-fi like zine quality to it which i thought was pretty cool um the thing that kind of bugged me about it in like specifically was that a lot of the um portraits um were reused in the book um particularly for like the various um secondary or background characters um it was like pretty obvious that they had made like a a limited number of these portraits and then just kind of like kept recycling them for these background characters. And I don't like saying that's lazy because I realize like that's like uh, calling something lazy is something that gets like hurled at a lot of artists by like shitty entitled fans. But like, honestly, it, it does kind of feel lazy. So I don't know. That was, that was the thing that sort of bugged me about it that I didn't like. Well, I, I don't know if I, 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 I want to like give her the best faith reading possible. Like, why would she do that? Do you think like, why would she be, what my my personal opinion is like well maybe they're background characters and they just come in and out so maybe it's not so important that they look distinct like they come in they fulfill some function like a greek we never, chorus right we never see them again so like, well, and I, who cares i found a lot um particularly with the guys that she was hooking up with that characters got reused a lot and I thought that was the point that right. um, that they are kind of nondescript and interchangeable, but also also playing um, kind of reversey on race stereotyping um, in the way that like she has been a stand-in for the other woman in 9/11 and a bunch of other Indian women in her life. Um, she's now forcing in, in this particular instance white men to be a stand-in for other white men. I was going to say the same thing. Like, it seems to me like it's. I like to assume I, my my assumption is not that the author is lazy, but rather that it's a deliberate choice. Like, she could have drawn five more characters, and and certainly at the point where like it was about to get published by whoever published it, uh, Random House, that, like, they, like, could have editorially pushed her to be, like, you know, draw five more characters. I think that it was, like, a a deliberate artistic and aesthetic choice. I read it very much the way that Juniper did, that, like, these characters almost become, I think the idea of a chorus makes sense, or, like, they're archetypal characters. There's, There's a handful of characters that are unique. Obviously, her son, her husband, her parents, uh, this woman who, like, like there are a lot, of, sort of the major characters are unique, but the, this, these, like, the boyfriends or some of the, these secondary characters are playing roles, like, societal roles. And so they are kind of duplicates like these these things show up again and again and again so that seems I, oh, i'm sorry go ahead joe no uh, um can i ask julie a question because i'm i'm curious to get her perspective on because i was reading along um and i was like okay like there are i'm not driving so much with it but like best faith reading so mira jacobs I made up this big thing in my head where I'm like, she probably went around and took all of these photos herself, right? And like, she put it on the page and she did awesome art stuff to it. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, this is cool. 
Um, <laughs> but then I got to the end, I'm like, oh, image credits. Like she pulled this from other places, um, which made me feel kind of ambivalent. So Julie, like, how does that square? Like, is like I, I'm just gonna make, I'm just gonna say it crassly. Like, is do you feel like that's an okay thing to do? Because I sort of had this reaction of like, well, maybe I would have liked it more if all of it was her images, but then she's pulling it from some other places. So like on the one hand, it's like, I appreciate kind of like the gorilla, like Oliver was saying, very lo-fi aspect to it. Like she's sort of empowering people to like, oh, you can do this stuff too, like I did. But on the other hand, like, I don't know. Like, so how, how, how does that approach like square with your perspectives and sensibilities, Jolie? Oh, we can't, I can't hear you. Are you muted? You, is your, is your uh, mouth piece adjusted correctly or? Nope, nothing, nothing. What's happening? We're gonna have to quit and get back on. The liberal media has silenced Jolie. Oh no. You leave and come back in and. Well, well I, I'd like to address that. Um, okay. If, if that's all right, if while Jolie figures yeah. her stuff out and Jolie sure. interrupt me whenever well, you get you're, voice. Um, it says you're no, muted. Not yet. You're muted now. Well, she now. Is, she is now, but she wasn't she wasn't before. Yeah, I just muted her and I'm trying to unmute her, but now she muted herself. Um. Juniper, go ahead. What were you saying? My audio. Oh, 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 now we can hear you. Oh, no. oh there we go. Sorry, I didn't. Um. Okay, I switched to my computer audio. Uh, okay, so well, the question was, how does that, okay, I don't, I, I didn't mind it, actually. I thought it was, um, I thought it was kind of smart. Um, I read the end credits where she talked about how the book came about, and she's a writer, mm -hmm. and she was encouraged to write this book, and then someone was like, you should draw it, and she was like, I don't draw. <laughs> and, and then, obviously, all of us are like, clearly, you don't. <laughs> but she, um, she did it. And then she used stock imagery. And um, I think using other people's art is fine if you pay for the rights and uh, you, you do credit where credit, or you give credit where credit's due. I like the collage sort of nature of it. She picked, um, I, I usually hate like photo real images, but for some reason, like they were non intrusive and. Um, she picked ones that worked mm -hmm. uh, with the, the the story that she was telling and um, like ones that would make sense. And, you know, like when she was making it with a guy in the alley, she picked like a good alley photo. Like, yeah, I, um, in some instances, like this one's gorgeous. <laughs> in some instances, I hate, I hate it. Like in Jessica Jones, when they use it, to make comic book art, lazy comic book art. I hate it. But this to me isn't lazy. She probably spent hours looking for the perfect images um, because I looked at some of the sources and most of the sources were like freebie non-royalty sites and they don't have um, like the perfect images because a lot of amateur, uh, a lot of amateur photographers were upload their shit to it. And it's like, you kind of, kind of like dig deep for the good stuff and, like Unsplash, she dig she dug real deep and got really good stuff. So I, um, because she has taste in the photography that she did world, I didn't mind it. Yeah, and I agree. Like I think it, it, it she did a good job of picking backgrounds that frame the panels, but they're not intrusive or distracting. Yeah, and I and I think curation is an art that's being overlooked in this conversation. Um, and like, that is, I, I, less so in, in Julie's point of, like she really dug deep for these things, but like she curated these all really intentionally and really skillfully and also derivative and reinterpreted works are the vast majority, if not all of art in human history. And I think it's, um, maybe more obvious here than in other cases, but um, there's wide genres of fantastic use art. And, and I, th I think this falls within that category. I'd, I'd like to say something about the art. Um, 
you know, I just like quickly scanned through a lot of the pages while we were sitting here. And one thing that really struck me was that the vast majority of the background photographs are just plain, real places. Somebody's mm -hmm. kitchen, an alley, a street, a store, an apartment, a box. I mean, they're just plain everyday things. And to me, what it did for me is it gave me more of a sense that this is like a real thing. This really happened. These people really said this. It, it, they really felt these feelings. And I, I think that you can't get that level of realism with traditional, you know, everything is illustrated by a comic book artist. And so I think it was a great choice on her part, part uh, to, to present her, her thoughts and her feelings this way. So. I, mean, I think there's, there's, to maybe build on that, there's something really interesting happening. Like, because I agree with Jolie, like for me, hyper-realistic art tends to turn me off in comic books. Like uh, we've had lots of these conversations over the years where like, like I'm, I'm really drawn to the sort of very, very painterly, like brush strokey Craig Thompson, uh, black and white art, uh, Jeff Lemire type, type stuff. Um, and if it's too realistic. And I think like this kind of thing would totally not work if it weren't for the fact that the images themselves that are put on top of it are so stylistic and so, um, and so simplified and so static, like that, like they're pushing in the opposite direction. So you have this like photorealism that sort of does what Mike Prime is saying, like, create that idea of feeling of memoir and like documentary, but on its own. And if the art was trying to do the same thing, if it was like, if it was sort of like an Italian photo comic, like if I, if you were to imagine the same thing, but instead of these drawings, it was actually pictures of people that would drive me crazy. Like that would that wouldn't be like a that would be a kind of static collage that I wouldn't like. But the the fact that these characters are hyper stylized uh, creates this like to me a tension between the 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 background and the foreground that I love. And I, I think Oliver's right. Like it probably appeals to the part of me that loves the low tech zine. Right, like it is clearly in that alt comic zine uh, genealogy, um, and like I buy that. I'm uh, I'll I'll eat that up. So for me, I I really dug it. Um, but part of it also, like I was trying, like I was thinking while you guys were talking. I was trying to imagine, <clears throat> could this be done better if it employed a different art? Well, no, and no, it, it just can't because like I was like, I was thinking, like, I just like I, when I was reading earlier, like I was looking at page 180, 181. And it's just like a conversation between her and her son. And it's really funny. Like these conversations between her and her fun, son are really funny, right? But if you like, I was trying to imagine, okay, take this conversation and, and try to translate it into a traditional comic. I mean, it's just her son and her having a conversation, right? And so like take that page and put it, make it into like a, a two by three grid and go back and forth between the characters and give them expressions and actions and talking. And all of a sudden, I'm just like, that doesn't, isn't more interesting to me. Like, watching the characters, like this, this particular conversation is, look, you're an American citizen, okay? What? You're every bit as American as Donald Trump. This country is, every bit, is as much yours as it is his. And you have every, every right to be here. All of a sudden, you put that into, like, traditional comic art. And you're, like, going back and forth between them and showing 
and having them act out and show their emotions and everything. And like, what, what is it like? All of a sudden he's like, what? No, you, like, to me, like trying to convey that conversation dynamically, I think you would lose the, the actual sort of emotional nuance of the conversation itself. So weirdly, I actually think the staticness adds, if that makes sense. Well, it's better because in this sense, because like I was the one feeding the sort of emotional register to their conversation, like, so, which is more effective in conveying to me like the stakes in the dialogue. Whereas like if you have an artist, like an Alex Ross giving you the facial expression, like it sort of takes that away. I think with, um, I feel like with this book, like, I mean, kind of, kind of the clue here is in the name, like it's good talks, like the, the focal point of the book is these, these dialogues, these conversations um, between the, you know, the, the protagonist um, and, you know, the, the other people um, around her. Um, is, is she a protagonist if she's a real person? I don't know, whatever. Um, We're all protagonists in our own lives. <laughs> we are, we sure are. Um, but between, between the, the author and, uh, you know, these, these other people in her life um, and really kind of, I think, uh, like what like what function the images serve is they're they're not really there um kind of in the sense that they they would be in like a, a traditional comic book where kind of you either have sort of the more action oriented stuff where they're conveying like physicality and um you know action and and these kinds of things or you know you kind of have the more sort of narrative stuff where like the the images convey like um emotion um and mood and, and subtext it's it's not really filling those functions instead it's sort of like feeling it's there to kind of like fill in the gaps that the prose can't um, or rather that the, the dialogue itself can't um, it's, it's there to kind of provide like a backdrop and like a context for these dialogues and to kind of help like provide sort of an immediate like visual element that immediately, you know, puts the dialogues in a, in a recognizable scenario, but but those images themselves are not actually the point. They're not the, the focus. The focus is the conversations. That's well, what the book is really about. Well, uh, right. And Jeff was saying, like, if you put in a traditional, I mean, you'll just get a bunch of talking heads, which is literally what the comic is, is right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it was a good choice because I, I, from my experience, like a lot of artists don't like drawing talking heads. <laughs> So, um, so, and the other thing I thought of with the art, and it's a memoir, and what I just noticed right now is because she's giving it to us mostly in the form of dialogue, like there's not a lot of narration. There's some narr there's narration on her part, but for the most part, it's conveyed to us via dialogue. And somehow for me, like that feels more genuine and believable. Because there's, there's not as much sort of internal editorializing on her part. Would it be like a text? Like if it was a text, like, like it would feel more like, oh, this is just coming from her perspective. But this kind of achieves, I don't want to call it a cheat, maybe a conceit of like, it feels a bit more pure because she's just conveying what happened through these, like I know she's the one doing it, but sort of the visual word bubbly parts of it makes it feel more genuine because it makes it feel like there's there's less internal editorializing on her part. Makes it feel like more objective because yeah, like we're just it's like zoomed out wrong. from her own right, right. Yeah, I I want to touch on that, but um, firstly, I want to um, say a couple of things about the art. Um, that I, I think one thing that I realized in my thinking about the reuse of characters is it really reminds me of Lena Cuts. And like those being recycled over and over and over again, and just kind of being stamped on these photos. And I think that the photos have an art antecedent in a softer world for those of who, you who read that webcomic. 
of just like photos with a little bit of text and the photos did um, kind of this background work of giving of scene setting for, for the text. It was just like a three panel web comic um, that were often pretty poignant. Um, and, and I think that this kind of follows in that tradition and the software world was like incredibly well received and was one of the more popular web comics of its time. Um, but, but when you said uh, web comic, it just made me re think of Ryan Ort's dinosaur comics. That's what exactly what I mean, Employing but... the same strategy, actually. Yeah. Um, and now I'm totally blanking on what I wanted to follow up to. I'm Patrick sorry. I, that was my fault. I, no, I it's okay. That was my sorry. fault because I had other things I wanted to get in. Um, could you, sorry, just rehash in a sentence or two your point? Oh, my point? Yeah. About? Before I jumped on you. Oh, um, how I felt that the narrative feels um, more genuine and pure right, in a sense because there's less narrate, there's less internal narration. Yeah, it feels it this like way. it feels like maybe a counterpoint to that would be, and not that it was bad, but um, always uh, would be Alison Bechdel, where like that editorializing worked in um, her first book, but not in Are You My Mother, mm. where like that was just all editorializing in it. Mm the book really suffered, in my opinion, for it. And I think that is saying, one of the strengths saying, here. Are you saying that uh, Funhouse suffered, or Are You My Mother? Suffered? Are You My Mother suffered, but Funhouse, I think, did, did a good job with it. Right. Right. So like, to Patrick's point, I think that editorializing is like, can be really fraught. And I, I think mm -hmm. stripping it away can be a really, here, worked really well, in, in my opinion. And I think it did, it works better to make it funnier. Like, I think there's some parts that just wouldn't be as funny right. or just a wall of text. Well, like there's, there's, there's a page where there's no dialogue and you just see like the dumbfound expressions on her and her husband. And I'm like, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. I'm glad you used that page for that. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's what I was going to say is like, for one, the idea of a, entire book that is essentially just static conversations is with very few, very little action, very little, very few events is kind of mind boggling to me. Cause like if, if someone suggested this and that person wasn't Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> uh, I'd be like, that's a horrible idea. Sometimes um, it's still a horrible idea. When it's, it's still a horrible Tarantino. idea, so. but it's, like it's it's a really hard thing to do to just have conversation and, and to just have dialogue, just have two characters sitting in a room, um, and it takes a lot of things to make that work. One of them is humor. One of them is like actual dynamic dialogue and interesting things to say. But like, man, it's not easy. And it, but if it, it's true, if you just had like to go the other direction, if this was just prose and it was just like page with a bunch of dialogue i think it would also be missing something and part of what and patrick that what you just said totally made me think about this um because one thing that I, I like i think about a lot with with comics but so there's something i think about with comics that i don't think gets talked about a lot um like what are what is the power of comics and like what can comics do that prose can't do and one of the things that i always sort of thought about was the fact that by using art and like the layout of the entire page you're controlling sort of the pacing of the reading mcleod talks about this a lot in understanding comics like the difference between like a page of the same like one like one panel like a guy like staring without speaking for nine panels in a row is different than one big panel of someone's staring like space is time <laughs> right mm -hmm. and so if you have like the way you position things on the page and the way you design the page like I think it's rarely talked about it, the way the way in which that really like controls the tempo of reading. And I have this like pet argument that in some ways 
comics are, could be closer to poetry in a way than they, than they are to prose. We, we always like think of them as a form of narrative and therefore we think of them as related to prose and novels and stuff like that. But the way that they control the way the eye moves around the page, it could be closer to poetry, right? Because like, in prose, you just like, you don't, you don't have much control over it. You just like a paragraph returns at the end of the line to the next line, right? Whereas poetry, you're, you're spacing things across the page however you want. You don't like, not always, like, but you have some control over space. And so that's one thing I was thinking, like, you're like, like a page like this where you have dialogue, 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 dialogue is very different than like that, right? And I think it's, it's used here for comedic purposes, but also to create like, o like open up spaces to think. I think there's like, it does a, a that kind of use of space is really smart in this book. And so while like, I think that it actually is something worth looking at, because I think it's where she, she uses it for humor, but she also uses it for thematic development, like giving us moments where we're like, like have to stop and think about what's being said, right? Um, so like that, that seems to me, Patrick, like I also noticed that those moments Good point, Jeff. I was listening to that. That was great. It's, I don't know, like we never talk about that. Like the, we rarely talk about the way artists use space to, to like guide our reading. And it's, it's so cool. It's something that comics can do that, like movies can't do that. Cause they just like, they can, you can like have big pauses, but like it's linear. Like there's, Comics control space, it's cool. Anyway, sorry. I get nerdy about that. Yeah, and, and piggybacking on more on your idea of like what this book succeeds at in the comic form specifically, rather than on your, your point about time, um, and also on Mike Prime's point about the photos being generic, um, I think it allow it, it breeds a sort of accessibility to the material that it wouldn't have in another medium where like yeah you, this maybe feels like it could be a sitcom or or a tv show or something in a lot of ways but i don't think it would be as emotionally accessible in in live action as it is here where where yeah jeff you're you're given these jokes and then you're given two pages with characters just staring at you and you're like oh right that's that's what that joke actually means and you have are forced to stop and think about it in a way that you wouldn't in in tv or film or or or, or normal or or just like written prose or or even poetry in a lot of senses also, just to like jump in real quick with a real quick point, something that this author does so fucking well is the asteri asterisk as a joke. Like there's like a couple, like there's like two or three times where she uses that. And it's just like each time it's just like so fucking hilarious because it'll be like she'll send, say something like along the lines of, oh no, I, I totally don't think that at all. And then there's an asker, asterisk <laughs> and at the bottom it says, I actually do think that. Like just yeah, kind of that like, like perfect. There. Yeah, it's like the, the, the Twitter joke of like, yada, 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 narrator she was, narrator she was. Yes. But like much smoother and not trite in that way. But like exactly. significantly more funny because of it. Like in that in that section with the that woman who wanted her to write her novel. Oh God, that section was so fucking funny. Just yeah, this, like I could not. It was so good. Like I was like, she must be making this person up. Like this no, cannot be a real like person. That. Like I could it's not. My family are descended from the founding I, fathers. I, I just like, what? 
Mike edited a movie for a woman who is just like that woman. Was she the founding fathers of Canada where she descended <laughs> from them? <laughs> no, but it was like, yeah. you know, a vanity, a vanity project that she quote directed. I'm sorry if I'm over speaking, but I don't know if you no, want to talk good. about it, Mike, but like, geez, please do. Please. Well, do. It's Mike's story. <laughs> well, are you talking about uh, charity? Oh yeah. That one. <laughs> I'm sorry, her name is charity. No, oh. the movie's name is Charity. I mean, it would have been perfect if her name was Charity. The character is called Charity, and she does Charity. <laughs> it is so bad. Get it? Get yeah. it? Because her name oh, is so Charity? Oh, so this is like the Lady Gaga movie where she was an ally because she came up in a drag club and then... Wait, her name was Ali. Ali, right? Is that the movie we're talking about? Come on. Hey, no, that's real too. <laughs> wow. Yep. Just because the gays claim you doesn't mean you should, like, you know, just lean right into it. Yeah, like, I'm like, of all the movies where you're calling yourself an ally and you come up as the only cis girl in a drag show and a straight, rich, white man comes in and finds the only fish in town and takes you home with them, okay, fuck off, (laughs) all the way. (laughs) On that note, should we talk about Michael Jackson? (laughs) Well, yeah. should, we, should we yeah we should no, but, but, your first oh question. also i did actually have a question and this is like totally off topic but like i had to ask this after you brought it up does canada have founding fathers are who there like founded canada <laughs> like who we have the fathers of confederacy which were the for one of the first prime ministers was john a Macdonald. yeah were they like they they founded and signed the the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Oh okay. shit! Okay. Yeah. Do they but have as much like mythology around, around them? them? No, because really, we never split off from the British Empire, so it wasn't That's, as big a deal. Hmm. All right. Hmm. <coughs> you real. Before we get to Michael, though, just the payoff of that woman. Like, I'm like, there's got to be something really awesome, right? And then she just gets this box. And I'm like, I'm both very tickled by how funny and absurd and ridiculous this per. But it, it becomes unexpectedly poignant later, which I thought was great. But anyway, back to Michael Jackson. Let's talk about Michael Jackson. Um, so we, I read this web comic where it was like somebody was complaining about there's all these uh, comic books with uh, all these guys talking about their relationships. And it's always from their perspective. You know, I was thinking of the Jeffrey Brown book that we read and, uh, you know, it was just like, you know, it it felt like a a good, like, kind of, you know, take on that sort of scene where it was like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, how I experienced this and all this other stuff. And then she was like, you know what, actually, I didn't know anything at all. So it was just, uh, you know, that's, I really appreciated that scene. I was like. Yeah, there's all these people that, you know, come into my life and make these snap assumptions about, but, you know, it's, um, you know, and, and like, that is a real danger with, not danger, but like a common thing in, in like these memoir comics that we've read, where it's just like, you're really just getting one person's perspective. And I felt like that story was really important because it was like, I mean, all of this is just my perspective and I really don't know anything about all these other people. You know, I don't really truly know, know them and haven't seen so many of them, you know. That was a really great moment. Yeah, I love that story. And one of the other things I really liked about it was just kind of this this arc of like, this woman is desperate to tell a story, but she has a fucking great story that she's not telling. And and like that that tension of like constantly kind of coming coming across her her child who died at two from cancer, but like just kind of making that that daily chatter but like oh i need to tell my story about my family that i actually don't fucking know anything about um i thought that was really really interesting in its own way yeah i was listening to uh michael lewis did a thing about uh coaching and he was like you know it was you know it's just this weird anecdote that kind of relates to that where it was like this person needed help getting into college and they kept asking her like well you know what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And it was just like, you know, she had this 
this horrible past. She was, uh, you know, she's like, I want to go to school and become a, a learn Spanish so I can help other people. And I was like, well, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? And it was like, well, you know, I was homeless for a while. and was taken in by a family and they didn't speak English and it, but they did so much for me and it was really important to me. So the point is, it's like, yeah, no, it was this great moment where, yeah, it's like, you know, recognizing that like maybe the story that you're best able to tell is not the one that you want to tell. And, you know, it's just, um, yeah, no, she had this, uh, you know, great moment of humanity and uh, you know it, it did a lot for you know for these static characters to be like you know they're all funny they're all uh, you know there, there's like this wry humor but it's like you know, there's also a, as much of a humanity as you're ever going to get within that story of these flat images of these flat people and it still conveyed I mean like you know I think we all felt in that moment, like, uh, you know, that, that these were as real as, as real people as, you know, any other medium. Or, I, I think she's, I think she's really good at, at like portraying like people as being, um, compelling and yet simultaneously very flawed like she's really good at at like portraying kind of like people and their and their foibles like um like this book has like quite a bit of racism in it um but like very rarely um is it like super explicitly like sort of you know kkk confederacy type racism there's some of that but a lot more of it is just kind of the sort of like clueless kind of casual racism um of like people saying like dumb things or making assumptions that they shouldn't be making and like the interesting thing is that that like this doesn't just come from the the white characters in the book um it also comes quite a bit from the non-white characters as well like she like a lot of the indian people that she knows um also seem to have like a lot of kind of very racist and, and colorist beliefs. And, and I think, I think um, one of your, your um, uh, discussion questions, Jeff was kind of about that. So I don't know if this is, if this is a good way, time to, to segue or not into, into that particular, into that particular topic. <laughs> Well, it sort of dovetails a little bit with my, the, the Michael Jackson, right? And, and sort of that, starting out with that. But I think, yeah, I, I think that it does seem like the, like, it's, it's sort of at the heart of this book, the way that she's, like, dealing with questions of race, um, trying to think about it. Mike, are you? Yeah, I really love that, Jeff. It was, you know, opening that way, it's like, okay, well, Michael Jackson is just like this really ambiguous, undefined person that the identity issues, it's really, this book is going to be complicated. There's not going to be any easy, explainable you know, one dimensional type of approach to this, it's going to be complicated because here you go. Here's Michael Jackson. Let's start with that. I don't, I don't know how deep we want to get into the Michael Jackson stuff, but like I, I, I recently discovered something within the last like year or two that like is about how a lot of, or not a lot of people, but some people, there is like a, a portion of the population that thinks like all of the, the pedophilia stuff about him is like made up and it's a frame job just to make him look bad. Um, and I had like not even remotely been introduced to any of that particular viewpoint until very recently. I don't know if that's a rabbit hole we really want to go down, but that's oh, just something I, I found out very let's recently. Not. Let's not. Let's not. <laughs> well, I don't think it's necessarily, but I think it's worth 
sort of acknowledging it because I think it, it's, it speaks to the complexity of the figure. Like, because I think on one hand there's who he is as a person and who he became, but it's also like who he stands for, for an entire generation. Like, so I think like all to me, like what, what I can imagine, like, I can totally imagine someone having that opinion in the same way that like, if there was someone that I loved so deeply and then I found out really awful things about that person, like, I think that it would be a very easy thing to want to sort of cognitively differentiate that. It's like cut that off and be like, nope, I'm going to partition that off here and just like, I don't want to believe that. And so I'm going to instead say it's, it's a lie or it's, it's a conspiracy or it's any number of like, so many people believe so many conspiracies for exactly that reason. But I think like so many of us grew up loving Michael Jackson. And so I think that for all of his, I mean, he's just extraordinary complex figure within popular culture, right? And I think that, so I think that stuff is, is relevant because it points to a desire for him not to be the stuff that we found out and the more complicated, problematic figure. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get us too, too terribly off topic from, from the book itself, but I do think there is kind of a discussion that does sort of connect with the book. Um, that's the topic around, I don't know, just like, like the various failings of people and kind of reconciling like the image that you you had about them in your head or sort of what their reputation was versus like sort of the actual reality of it and what their, their failings in particular were. And like, I'm thinking very much about like all of the like male celebrities that in the last five years have been like outed as like secret sex pests and how that kind of like uh, connects in a lot of ways to, um, sort of like uh, the character and her relation, um, you know, the, the author and her relationship um, with her step parents in this, or not step parents, um, parents in law with her parents in law in this book and kind of like reconciling how she feels about them as people versus like their supporting of Trump and like how conflicted that makes her feel and just sort of that overall, I don't know, just kind of general sentiment of like having to, to reconcile with like recognizing like a person's humanity and empathy and compassion and how they can treat you while also, you know, trying to, understand that in the context of like a lot of the fucked up things that human beings routinely do. And I feel like I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but hopefully you're, you're understanding the kind of the point that I'm making. And, and I feel like there is just kind of this, this conflict that's, that's very often sort of present. And also I think like for some of us where like that wasn't a surprise, like I often feel like, like with this last cycle and the previous election cycle, like, why are y'all surprised? Like, what country have you been living in? Like, this was a surprise? Like, this was not a surprise. Like, well, uh, racism disappeared like, when we elected Obama, right? Isn't, isn't that what happened? Clearly. It says it in the book. They, had, they quote the Audacity of Hope speech. And then everything after that is fine. <laughs> I, that is one racism thing that, solved mm -hmm. like i wish we saw that discussion like the book ends i think they were landing in florida right but we never or at least she chose not to extend the narrative that far like i would have loved i would have liked to see it um but yeah i, I mean I, it's an interesting choice that she ends it there <laughs> but yeah, oliver i think you're reading too much of michael jackson's history into it i think it's 
like uh, you know I, I think Jeff talked I wasn't about- I wasn't really talking about Michael Jackson specifically it was more that Michael Jackson was kind of a a springboard for me thinking about these uh, topics in more depth if you understand what I'm saying yeah but I, I feel like there's also the aspect of his skin color changing I was gonna say, right. of the pop culture figures he has the most um, interesting confusing racial history yeah, I can't think of any other pop culture figure who well, was I a mean, black man that turned into a white woman, as I mean, they say. He had ventiligo. Ventiligo? Uh, yeah, but um, he also bleached his skin. I know, but... Because like, it was... Yeah, I mean, like, like um, there's a Fox, uh, <sighs> local Fox News reporter. He would come into to where I worked a lot, and he had ventiligo, too, and he did the opposite. Well, it, it, was, it was like a way for her to, like, launch the discussion. I mean... Like her kid asking the questions, sort of what prompts her to ask all of these mm-hmm. different questions. Right. right. So I mean, I mean, the book isn't really about Michael Jackson, right. really. Right. <laughs> I feel like uh, Jeff asked a question about why does it start with Michael Jackson, and that's because her kid asked the question. Yeah. Well, and, and but like, mm-hmm. and narratively, it's yes. his skin color is right so fluid in a way that like a few pages she wishes hers was as well like she has an illustration of herself yeah um, yeah her bleaching her own skin. it it's like it's a soft landing i right. maybe landing's not the right like a soft takeoff well, um i mean i'm sure her of... son asked about hundreds of celebrities you know and she picked this one i mean there's her son is doing nothing but asking questions it's i like, think she's she's using michael jackson kind of as a I don't know the right terminology, but like the closest thing I can really think of to say is she's using him as like a framing device in order to talk about kind of the weird like interplay and juxtaposition of like light and dark skin, if that makes sense. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and... Also, oh, sorry, Keith. Oh, no, no, just... Uh, uh... Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I think it's like a, a good, uh, something that a kid would probably ask about. Although, he's probably too old. But that, but I mean, that's always like, I'm always like, that, like, saying, well, it's something that her kid, like, you're, she's still making a very deliberate choice, like, to start the, the narrative. Like, this narrative is a crafted narrative. It's not, it's not something that is, it, like, she's making deliberate choices to, like, there, there, it's a bunch of mini essays, right? Like, and she, this is not a, an, a, an essay that she has to tell. It's not one that she has to put right there. It's, so it's a deliberate choice. So it's not quite, it doesn't quite work just to say, well, it's something that her son would have told her that she's, she's crafting this in the same way that she would a novel. She's making a choice to start out there. And I, I think what I would look at is like, I don't know, like, I think it's impossible to bring up Michael Jackson without bringing it, without making us think about how complicated he is. But I don't think that this text per se engages with the the moral ambiguity that is Michael Jackson, other than just sort of like, what is like, what do you do when your six year old says, "I want to be Michael Jackson," <laughs> and as an adult, you're like, "Well, oh, there's like, you know, like you're like, okay, but like clearly, Get like five, start dancing for two hours." <laughs> Yeah, like one thing I'll just say super quick, like again, I don't want to get us derailed, but like any any discussion about like Michael Jackson and like all of the like weirdness surrounding him really can you cannot discuss that without like mentioning the like horrific abuse that he suffered at the hands of his father. Yeah. And I just wanted to to make that explicit. Yeah, but I don't think she was telling her six-year-old about that. Well, I think yeah. And I don't think her six-year-old was finding too, it. Too like, how are you going to describe to your six-year-old all the intricacies of Michael Jackson? <laughs> it's like, okay, it was the 70s. It's like, oh, geez. Yeah. But can't we just... Is, I think it is, but I think the text is very deliberately, within the first five pages, engaging with the question of 
of Michael Jackson in terms of race. And, and, and I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's super interesting coming because then coming from a six year old, it then becomes a question not of like what it means to be a pop star, but what it means to be uh, a person of color in a, in America. But it's, like it's made, like I think that Michael Jackson is so interesting because in her, in this particular case, like as she says on page seven, I'm East Indian, my husband is Jewish, we live in the same block, a lot of mixed race kids live on our block, a lot of everybody lives on our block, do I? And so this six year old is trying to come to terms with his identity and his race and so this idea of like colorism and darkness, like, cause it goes very quickly into the narrative of, of what it means to be like darker skinned in India. Like the second, is it the second chapter where she's, so like this whole idea of that race isn't just about race. It isn't just about black or white or that like ultimately it's, like a discussion of race in America or India or anywhere in the world is a question of, of nuance and subtlety rather than these like sort of ham-fisted attempts at, at simplifying it that we often undergo. So like, to me, it's like, it's just like right in front of us, let's throw this out there. Like, skin color as is like really, really like gradient thing that is super, super loaded. Mm -hmm. And Michael Jackson does kind of do like to be, so for a six year old to be obsessed with Michael Jackson is kind of interesting. I agree. The, the music's great, you know? Everything else is awful, but. Yeah. And like, I think it's, it's her way of uh, like using her six year old and his newfound obsession with Michael Jackson is a way of illustrating, like, uh, is a way of illustrating how complicated it really is to navigate a conversation about Michael Jackson, because it is pure in purely innocent. And even when he does start asking harder questions um, and then wanting to, wanting to change his hair, uh, so that it's so that it's just like Michael Jackson's afro when he was like in the Jackson Five. It's like how how do you get um, how do you explain that to your son um, that those things that he like the, the changing of his name, the changing of his skin color, um, and then even some of the questions that he's asking, like how do you tell your son that s some of these thoughts aren't correct? Like how do you correct? The, the thoughts <laughs> how do you explain to him why these why these things are not right why they are why they are not as innocent as he like as they are because he's six so and he's asking some very adult questions like it ranges like can he really walk on the moon to like like and really funny stuff like what is a latoya <laughs> but then he asks it's like intermixed with some really hard stuff like is his skin like my skin is his hair like my hair and and it made like th those kinds of questions and reading them on the page it was just like no i i like and i i draw from my own experience like who who was there to uh, teach me the answer to those qu questions are there correct answers and it's just like no but the correct answer is just truth. So, and, and it's like, and this is how, this is how she dealt with it. And I, you know, that's, to me, that's why I feel the point is. It's like, that's great that he, it's not great that he has a strange pedophilia history and he has a very like strained relationship with his father, but that's not the point of bringing Michael Jackson into this book. It's very much about these questions and navigating these questions with a six-year-old and then an eight-year-old and then you know what I mean like like and then also um how 
she used her experience, her own experience to try to answer these questions. And she's the fact that she still can't answer these questions for herself is a, is a very big part of this book. And it's like, I'm 37 in January and I don't have answers. I have the same questions still and they sound stupid, but I, I, don't have the answers and she th- she thought as a child that when she was this age all of these things would be figured out and that racism wouldn't exist but here we are uh feeling like abandoned uh by people who voted republican you know what i mean like anyway <laughs> mm-hmm. that was my take on the whole michael jackson thing but, like, I, I think you're right on point there the whole idea of her her using a six-year-old who it's like one of those movies where, you know, you have the main character, but then you have somebody come in from out of town and the main character has to explain to this new person, everything that's going on. It, it kind of, and it gives her a chance to be honest uh, to, you know, when her son asks her or when she reflects back and when she was young and then you get to the end of the book and it's just like, yeah, that's the whole point. It's like, I don't have any of these answers. And it's really about like doing our best job to love these other people. And, and to do the best we can with that. Even the people who voted Republican, it's like, we got to love them too. We can't like shut down and, and just push all these people who disagree with us away because then it's just worse. I, it's, it's like so complicated and, and there's no easy answer to any of it. It's just like being human, I guess. I don't know. But in, in the course of reading the book, like what do you think her answer is or what answers can you draw have or can you draw any answers to that question from reading this book of um, like how do you deal with those people which thankfully is a problem i don't have but how do you deal with those people i don't have an answer but there's a fucking pigeon in I, indeed I know. I was. I was. I was eyeing that. That's how sweet, do you deal with that child? Pigeon. I mean, what the oh, fuck? Why start pigeon? I have nothing to say about anything, but that's does, amazing. Does do tricks? Uh, Ash, my partner, is teaching it to pack something on command. <laughs> which is like good because then you can use that for a recall because you could be like pick this thing across the room. And then the bird was, will fly over eventually, in theory. She really live, like, yeah, had... live in, like, the Blair Witch set, and you have a pigeon. Oh, yeah, I think Ash might be related to Kratz Creatures, um, or, like, this is might be Zabufu over here. I love that. <laughs> What's your pigeon's name? Um, this is some great connection. I think well. So, um, I, sorry, we were on a good point. I didn't mean to. Yeah, it was like, that. how do you how do you deal with people in your life that have like shitty Republican yeah. views? And when I figure that out, I will let you know. I don't know. Do you think that the book gives answers, or do you think it just gives ask questions? I I, I kind of got at the end. It was just like, well, you deal with them as best you personally can. I don't think you can uh, do so. it better than that. I mean. There's, I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of people who love Trump and voted the other way from me. And, and I look at like, they're not voting in their best interest. I don't know where you go with that. I, I've never been able to convince anybody. I don't know. I don't know if it's about convincing. I, I really, you know, I, I profess to be Christian and I profess to like, I want to love my neighbor. Sometimes I just have to ignore they're less than wonderful aspects, I guess. You know? mm-hmm. I mean, I look at it that way, I guess. It's like we, I have to find a way to, to care for people and, and, and respect people that differ from me. I feel like I'm called to do that. Um, when I don't do that, things always get worse. Mm-hmm. I know that's true. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I think it's something also that you know the, the author goes back to at some points uh, like uh, these qu- she it seems like she was saying that she kind of had answers of America and what it would be when she grew up and then she's realizing she's like you know 
why are we still asking the same questions that Z is asking, you know, mm -hmm. so many years later? And, you know, I had an answer for this when I was a kid. And the answer I have now is different. And how do I reconcile those two America? I mean, like, I think that's like an explicit in one of her, her uh, stories. But yeah, she cycles back to this. Um, hmm. She also cycles back. What was the other thing? Are they anthropological? I mean, no. yeah, she's, she questions like, how, does, how do I reconcile? I have these two different versions of America that exist at the same time. Like, Maybe it's like the, um, the classic philosophy view. Like you have the, the what is it? The, the thesis, the antithesis, and then you should have the synthesis after that. Maybe she's still looking for the synthesis. Mm. yeah like the yeah. whole everything that keith is talking about it's just it's encompassed in like everything she narrates on page 20 she's like the more i talked about it the more i realized how confused i was about the two like the two parallel americas that i thought existed the one that accepted accepted me and my family um, and that I saw was changing and becoming great. And then this, this other one. Yeah. And it's like, and it, and how, um, no matter what point in time America was at, whether when it was like her first immigrating and then like nine, like Ferguson, nine 11, the election in 2016, like it just, it, it not only didn't change, but it just continued to get worse and worse and more and more confusing as time went on. Um, it just created more questions in life and it, uncertainty. Oh God, I, I I almost forget what that time used to be like. And like even here after nine eleven, like in Canada of all places, people like feared the brown scourge. Like they were responsible for everything that happened, and like the, like every brown person was a terrorist. Like I forgot what that was like, and this book reminded me that that shit happened. Mm -hmm. not just like not just out inside new york like where it should have ended but yeah and that's still a thing in in montreal <laughs> right and, oh like, yeah with hijab bands and things um but yeah i feel like that page 20 is really like in a lot of ways a thesis statement for the book um at, where i feel like not that the book follows a, a linear timeline um but it kind of follows this kind of an arc of the character growing up in their relation to race. Um, and I felt like <coughs> through the book, her conceptualization of race and its impacts um, became more mature. Um, and, and kind of it, th that very, like, the more I talk about it, the harder it becomes and the more confusing it gets. And in both her her maturity talking about race, but also in, in the linear timeline that a book specifically has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just, I, I want to address like how comforting strangely it was to find that she within her own, um, within her own culture dealt with um, the same, like, shittiness of her parents and like them trying to arrange for her to be married like dealing with her own cultural differences and um and being like an um, a new american while at the same time dealing with like shitty racist americans it's like you don't think she does enough on her plate and the whole um it it, it was just compounded and, and yeah i mean i wasn't you know, my parents weren't trying to arrange a marriage for me, but like they were trying to do other stuff and the skin bleaching was definitely one of them. So <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Asian countries. I don't know. I don't know about, um, Filipinos, right, Patrick? Yeah. I'm not sure about Filipinos, but like every Asian, uh, from almost every culture that I've encountered, except for the Japanese are like really into skin bleaching and have a very low opinion of, you if you are like a darker mm -hmm. if your d skin is darker by heritage it just it means like you're you're you grew up in a race patty and you're poor mm -hmm. right so 
Yeah, I mean, there's not, like, it, it's been forever since I've been back, so I don't know if, like, skin bleaching has suddenly become a thing. But, like, there's certainly yeah. a premium placed on, like, lighter skin Filipino people. So, like, yeah. they, they carry a lot of cultural cash, like, whether it's deserved or, well, it really shouldn't be anyway. But Yeah. And, like, to see that she went through that, it was, like, one, it was unnerving. It was infuriating, but it was also comforting. I don't know. In a weird way. And she presents it in a very disarming manner. Like, these are, like, deep topics, but yeah. also funny. Yeah. <laughs> are these the parts that Sean was like, why are you laughing? Yeah, like, why are you laughing? It's funny. It, yeah. it is funny. Yeah. We're, we, we can laugh. <laughs> we can laugh. He, does, he does this thing, and I think she is inviting you to laugh, but that's, which is kind of a hard thing, like, to, like, invite someone to laugh at race right um but like she does i think she does this very smart thing where she like i'm just even looking at the first chapter like this conversation she has with her son it's really funny right like can i make my make my hair like michael's no why not because that's cultural appropriation what that's using someone else's ethnicity to make a passion statement what you look silly oh okay right like uh it's 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 clever it's funny it's making a point but it's like using the six-year-old to like cut past it past the bullshit and like you can't like you can't talk to the six-year-old like you would talk to a 20-year-old or 30-year-old so you have to have a different conversation and it's and it's funny and then you get to page 14 and all of a sudden she like zooms out and you're going from this like this and it's like this moment of like the thoughtful moment um i feel like she does this at at several points like it's that moment of pausing like it'll be humor 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 and then all of a sudden but wait let's stop and think about this for a second and she's like like i'm having this fairly like this conversation that's making me think about like, how do I talk to my six year old about race? But it's kind of funny and it making you chuckle. And then all of a sudden she's like, but this reminded me of my growing up and what, like all the questions that I asked. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh damn. So it's like breaking, like breaking it open into the sort of like the larger thematic thing. And like, she does the same thing with that section with the, the woman, the writing the book for that woman where like you're going like, and it's, it's, this woman is awful and it's funny and ridiculous. And you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe this actually happened. And then you get to the end of that chapter. And that, that, that and, kind of made me think of another thing about that woman's that, that part of the book where I thought it was so maybe a piece of poetic justice where like at some point she just literally started writing like an original story about it. Like she's, she's just crafting this story out of nowhere. (laughs) And the woman was still like, yes, that's, that's exactly it. Like that's how it was in my brain. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) what? Which was, which was fantastic. (laughs) I feel like you're stealing it from me. Yeah. I feel like you're stealing it from me. Like what? (laughs) Steal my idea, are you? Um, yeah. that, her idea that's all in this box. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's, I mean, that's so funny and all, but then she's like, at the, la- the end of that chapter on page 217, all of a sudden she's like, I was looking at my son, who's two, and I, re- and I realized that this woman lost a, a daughter to mm-hmm. cancer when she was two. And like, whatever crazy that woman legitimately was, there's also this other thing going on with her, like this intense pain. And she's like talking about how her husband doesn't see her and, and she's become this like cocktail story, right? Like this story that she tells and like, I, and everyone laughs and like, oh my God, I can't believe this woman, but she's so ridiculous. And she is. And then she's like, oh my God, like, I also didn't see her, right? And like this zooming out and you're like, oh shit. 
Like the point wasn't that this woman is ridiculous, even though that's there. The point is, I like I like I failed, right? And no, and it's and it's true. Like I think it happened for me too when she was telling the story about her Mormon teacher and yeah. uh, having grown up in Utah when that when that vignette started. I was like, oh, I know where this is going. I know for exactly sure. what's going to happen. And then my expectations were hor- were delightfully dashed. And like I ended the book, I'm like, I l- she's my favorite character yeah, in this too. whole thing. Cause like she's severe and she, and I mean, she, she fulfills my, ex- some of my expectations about what Mormon people are like. But at the end of it, it's like, like she's like, she has this commitment to like this vision of what America is and what inclusion means. Mm-hmm. And like, despite how much of a hard ass she is, like she, it, it was very interesting and very cool to me that that, per- that, that person exists. And one thing I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll and- say is, um, one thing I'll say is this, this um, the author is very good at communicating like subtext and I'm thinking of like two scenes in, in particular, um, the one that Pat just mentioned um, with the teacher, um, but also um, the other one is the scene with her, with the author in high school, and she's with her black boyfriend mm-hmm. and his friend, and the author like inadvertently like says mm-hmm. something very racist where she like assumes that um, her boyfriend's friend is not smart enough to know what cardiovascular means. <laughs> and she like explains, oh, it means heart doctor. And everyone is just like super quiet. And she like immediately realizes how much she fucked up. But it just like, she's, she's so good at just like communicating those subtleties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think to, to piggyback more on Patrick, but so on Oliver too, I think, the part and from what I've gathered of how the last 25% fleshes out the the rest of the book. um, I think part of what the book is doing is like, yeah, we have to deal with Trump supporters and and people who we disagree with vehemently um, the best we can deal with them, but we also have to see them. And that's something that we're missing a lot. We're like, I didn't see this woman for the pain she had with her child. And we as readers, um, at least me and, and Patrick and I don't, anyone else didn't see this Mormon teacher as like finishing on like, you're fucking American and you believe it and fuck everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I, I think that there's this, like she keeps doing the subversion of expectation throughout the book. Um, and I think to, to, clarify and to underscore people's humanity common humanity and i think that that's it sounds like that kind of maybe gets to be a through line fleshed out into her relationship with her in-laws and and other trump supporters yeah uh juniper i'd like to kind of like go off of that and and some of what some of the others are talking about you know I like studying history and especially like the civil war and things like that. I mean, things are in in some ways a little better things in a lot of ways are worse, but you know, there's this constant racism. It's always been there. You know, I I look at like how the last election turned out. You could like draw a bell curve. Half the people vote, basically half the people voted for Trump. Half the people voted for, for Biden. I mean, there's such consistency in like this, this dark underbelly that's, that's always been there. It's never really gone away. And I think what the book is, is really, it's really doing is, is kind of like showing how it's really not the racism that changes. It's as we grow as people, as individuals, as we grow up, Mm. our interpretation of what's going on changes and how we're confronted with having to, you know, it's not black and white like it is. Her son is just trying to make everything black and white. She was trying to make everything black and white when she was a kid. But as we grow older, we see all these nuances and complications, and we, we are confronted with 
Like, well, how do I, how do I love my in-laws when they're voting for the guy who wants to hurt me? You know, I, I, so I think in the book, it's, it's more like it's, it's really showing an evolution of our comprehension and understanding of what racism is, as opposed to um, some changes out there in the environment, because it just seems to me everything's always been terrible. In, in many places and in other places, it's just wonderful. And how do we come to terms with that? Well, and see, I think that's, that seems so true. Like, I think that she, like, I want to go all the way back to maybe it was Oliver's question, like, or uh, I can't remember who asked, like, does it seem like she's providing an answer to this problem? And I think that, and I, like, in some ways, I don't think she is. <laughs> and I think that's partly because she recognizes that any, any simplified answer is going to be unsuccessful, that there is no, there's no real solution. Um, because, like, for exactly that, like, whatever, whatever, in, like, progress we seemed to have made in the last 20 years, then is, it seems to be, have been erased overnight, we go, have gone backwards, and she's grappling with that, right, like, like, what does it mean to like? What does it mean to try to make sense of this historical moment of our country voting for this person who is just straight up outright racist? Um, but it seems to me like part of her answer is one like this is too complex to. There's no real straight up solution. But the closest thing she can like it seems to me like what she's saying in addition to try to see people in their complexity is, is exactly that, like good talks. Like, like, what, like what are we, like what can we do actually engage in good talks? Um, like how do we understand people through conversation? How do we learn more through conversation by having the good talks? And so like, Yeah, those people, like her, her in-laws voted for Trump. What can you do? Well, are you going to convince them? No. But what does it mean to have a good talk? Like, so in some ways, I think, Patrick, you were saying, like, you wish you had seen the next scene. Like, when they, like, land in Florida, you want to see that conversation. Um, and maybe that's true. But, like, I think that in some ways to me what the ending was saying is like she's making the trip and she says i'm not doing this for them i'm doing this for you and for him right but at the end of the day she's showing up she's like she's she she will have the conversation and i think that's what a lot of us aren't doing right like we're not engaging in the conversation anymore mm -hmm. we're, we're each going into our bubble and are talking to the people who agree with us. And when we do engage in the conversation, it becomes a, not, it's not a good talk. Like the way the political discourse in America today, especially if you like look at discussion boards online, that's not good talk. Well, you're not going to get a good talk from the internet, Jeff. No. <laughs> no. That's false. We're on the internet right now. Al Gore's internet giving us all a good talk. This is a special <laughs> exception space. <laughs> but I, I also just, I don't want us to go down this dark hole, but I think we should all, like, the, the fucked upness of American electoral politics isn't, like, a thing you can't not mention. when Because, like, because mm -hmm. of the electoral college, I feel like there's a lot of, like, fucked upness and distortion that happens when people vote that may tend to render some trends and factors more outsized than they really are. I mean, not to underestimate the problems because they're big, but I mean, he lost the majority vote in 2016. 
like that was a thing. So I, something you just keep in mind is like just the fucked upness of the electoral college and how fucked up it makes everything. Abolish the electoral college. Mm-hmm. Abolish so Canadians, don't you <laughs> worry. It's just a fucked up thing we have to do. Is they think you're whatever so that it doesn't exist there. Yeah. Well, we we uh, yeah. Whatever. We're not talking about it, but <laughs> aren't My we? My favorite though? thing from 2016. <laughs> I um, voted and immediately flew out to Montreal. And my partner got back at like 8 p.m. and was like, it's not done yet? What's taking so long? <laughs> right. Dude. I'm like, oh, honey, get back to me in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. I remember, just, so this year, I remember it was like, it was like a Saturday and people were talking. It was like a Friday or a Saturday and people were talking about like um, votes coming in for states. And I was like, is this election, is this fucking election still not over? And then I, I think it was like, I don't know, Saturday or Sunday where it was like finally called and I was like, fuck, finally. Well, it's still not over. It's yeah, never over. Mm-hmm. The, I, I'm just still flabbergasted by the idea that you don't just like, you know, go into an old school gym and they hand you a piece of paper and you check a box or you write in a name and you hand it back to that person who handed it to you. Like, What? Well, I mean, no, that is basically how it works. That is basically how it works. Except this year, yeah, because of the gyms. pandemic, there was just an outsized, like, people voting through the mail, which... Yeah. Oh, I awful. thought there was, like, other, like, in other places, there's, like, different... Some places like, use, like, electronic voting. I have never used that. Okay, I, don't, cool. I don't know how it works. Yeah, yeah so, like... like I, I trained as a poll worker this year. I didn't, because I ended up having COVID during the election. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but, like... At least in Michigan, like basically, you get a paper ballot, you mark some checks, and then you put it into a machine, and it tabulates it rather than being hand tabulated. But there are like also like easy voting computer voting machines, which like you can use for any reason, but like they're bigger text, easier to touch, and like you can talk to them, and they'll interpret stuff. So there's like there are other mechanisms for voting, but like here, like my usual voting district is like the gym of a church that's nearby so okay cool it is pretty pretty similar it sounds okay i mean but now because of uh school shootings they don't let people into schools anymore so you had to move it to other locations no mine's at a school really yeah i i voted at a school in the primary um because school is out on election day oh i I voted a gun shop keith (laughs) <laughs> I you know what, my you're a true with, patriot what mike is that even <laughs> oh my god like really hmm. no. <laughs> if only but the cuck liberal media wants to take that away from us <sighs> i would not feel safe in there doing anyway all right yeah so anyway let's circle back to the whole good talk like the actual yes. words good talk I remember the part, like, I, I just, I just think it's hilarious because it's just, it's a series of good talks, right? And her, um, her talking to her husband, like, and her in-laws, like, should we be telling J- uh, our sons, uh, I almost called him Zed, um, okay. should we, should we be talking to Z about this? And he's like, cause he's six. And she's like, of course we should, we should always be talking to him. And then there's that scene when they're on the bus and he's telling knock knock jokes and they're, they're the canoe knock knock jokes. And he's like, can you stop talking about it already? And then the black guy who's sitting beside Z is like, <laughs> that was the best talk in the book. Cause it's like, he gets it. He knows he's, he may be six, but he, he knows what you're doing. So I thought it was really cute. Yeah, I thought that vignette set a really, really good tone for the book. Yeah. Because that pretty shortly followed up the Michael Jackson vignette, which kind of set up the theme. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like that vignette set up the tone. Yeah. For sure. It's also like, um, she talks with her friends, the other writers, and they're all like, why are you talking to your son about this? Like, he's too young. You know, this is, you know, but she's like, you know, well, I got to be honest with them. And they're like, no, you don't. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, these, 
that these two happen. childless hoes in the bar like <laughs> and like i thought the same thing it's like you don't know until you have kids but when they're six when they're f- hell when they learn how to speak in sentences they will ask you tough questions and you will have to provide tough answers <laughs> eh, because yeah. yeah they're not all poop jokes <laughs> <laughs> They're like ninety eight percent poop jokes, though. So, yeah, yeah. When I was uh, when I was really young, um, I I learned the word orgy from uh, from the special features of the uh, Matrix Reloaded DVD because there was an SNL skit where they make a joke about orgies, and I asked my parents what's an orgy, and they told me it's a really big party. And so I I went to school, and after school, I had latchkey. So I went to one of the counselors at latchkey, and she had arrived late, and I asked her if she had been at an orgy. (laughs) And I got got in trouble really badly, and I didn't understand why. (laughs) Well, you know, in ancient Rome, they called them orgies, too. I feel like the, yeah, whatever. There was always sex at those parties, let's be honest. I was like, maybe the origin of the word was to be like, you know, a large group of people congregating. No, 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 no. They're always sexual in nature. Who are we kidding here? I'm just going through the discussion questions to see if there's anything we really risk that we missed. But by the way, I do want to, one, commend Jeffrey for writing all of these questions. Um... I wonder if he's like an educator. <laughs> That's what I thought. I and also, hard enough. Let's give right? a round of applause, applause to Jeff. Yeah, and I wanted I want to just point out question eight, section C I about um I two one, where he mentions all of these like really prolific artists, and I was like, we didn't get to talk about it, but we could have talked about Mac Weems and like Barbara, Barbara Kruger, and it would have been nice. But we'll talk about them later. Because, <laughs> yeah, if anything, that's what the art kind of reminded me of. Right, there's sort of like an outsider art. It, it definitely, like, there's, there's a stream of art. Like, some of it's a little bit pop art like you, and sometimes it's a little bit kitschy. Like, you see, I feel like you see a lot of... <clears throat> some of it is stuff that you see on, like, buttons and magnets in places in downtown Royal Oak, but like <laughs> yeah. or mugs, but it's, there's like a, a certain type of art that is happening these days. Yeah. Look up Royal Art Lodge. I think. Could- oh no, that's what I was going to say. It was like, why did you bring up the Royal Art Lodge? Cause I, I can only, I can only think of Marcel Zama when I think of the Royal Art Lodge, but the other, the other fellows in the lodge are very much like, yeah, like uh, art that you consider that to me, like if we want to talk about outsider art in, in, in the context of this book is that this is very much like a zine. And whenever you see like zine uh, creators at like a convention, everyone, everyone looks down on them. Every single creator there has created a zine and none of them are putting their zine on their table. And (laughs) it's because of, there's like this hierarchy and it's like somehow she's elevated this kind of outsider comic book art um, into the like graphic novel, the graphic novel realm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is to be respected and acknowledged. Eric Hellman does, has done the same thing. Like, taking that sort of like awkward, slightly static art and like made it into New Yorker. Like in, yeah. uh, the Chad zine versus the Virgin graphic novel. Mm-hmm. So there's all these questions too about like, like um, memoir and I'm not really like, I'm not, I didn't study literature or anything. So I'm not really familiar with like, uh, the conventions of things like it, of memoirs I've just read them so mm-hmm. I don't know if there's like typical things that I should be looking for or I've read very few very yeah. few memoirs yeah I'll have to say Ginger Spice's memoir is very good <laughs> oh okay anything Mariah Carey it was fantastic so. what one 
I just read Mariah Carey's and it was awesome. Oh my God, look at you two. <laughs> Ginger Spice and Mariah Carey. Yeah. They're, they're really good. Look, what they're other really memoirs do you really need? Let me, ask, let me ask you this. So actually in both those cases, are they, would you say they're, they're memoirs or are they autobiographies? I'm not really sure what the dis- tell us. Well, what let's the let's defi- know, yeah. yeah define mm-hmm. the, the well, distinction without, without defining it. I'm not. I'm not for a second. I'm not going to define it. I just want to, like. <clears throat> I don't know. Like I guess it's a memoir because it's kind of rambling and not chronological. Okay. And like I, it didn't feel like she was trying to convey a life story but more like explaining to me a super fan like why am i this way and why is my mariahness manifesting in all of these different ways like like she doesn't dance in her concerts and i always thought like why is that a thing like all these other pop stars go into like complex choreography but mariah would just typically like you know she's singing and she's swaying a little bit like it's sort of like a pointed thing like she doesn't dance she doesn't need book. to. She doesn't. She doesn't. But I always wondered, like, why is that? What's fueling that choice, right? And her obsession with Christmas was also explained. So mm-hmm. I, like, okay, that's that's cool. Yeah, like, and the for the, as far as the book that I read, and maybe it, it was like very uh, chronological, like from birth to Spice Girl, and then X Spice Girl. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's the difference i don't know it's like a very I mean, point I mean, a to b yeah. and then there's less there's less thoughts and more telling like she's not trying to she wasn't trying to draw any um value or meaning she was just really trying to entertain the reader with her life story and that's maybe the difference is that like this is a memoir in that it, it creates questions within the reader while still entertaining us. It's not meant to be like an illustration of her entire life. Mm-hmm. Here's, 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 here's kind of a weird question that I just thought of. Like if, so for the people in this discussion right now, if you looked back at your life and tried to draw like some kind of unifying like thematic thread to it some kind of like deeper meaning to like the events that have happened throughout your life could you do it if i thought about it for more than 10 seconds i i think that would be more of a memoir yeah when i think of a memoir there's the ones that i've read there's usually a theme Uh, a lot of them seem to be like coming of age stories um, autobiographies and biographies. It's like, I was born on this day and then this happened and then this happened and I got older and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I got really old and I can't write or think anymore. <laughs> yeah, but happened to me at like 17. <laughs> Stop being able to think and write. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that, that it's probably pretty fluid, but I'm, I'm like, I think that a lot of that does seem to capture the 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 gist of it that like like what Mike Prime just said, like autobiography and biography tends to be more focused on the facts and the events. And memoir moves away from that in lots of different ways. Like it can be more about like the the like the person just talking about themselves in sort of a free flowing way, or it can be linear, but trying to tell a good story, like thinking of it more as a narrative. And I think in general, like I tend to think that, and I think a lot of memoir focuses less on the events themselves and more on the perception of the events and the perspective of the events. Um, the like inner emotional life and experiences. How you, like, how you see it. So like, if I, like, if I wasn't, it's more of a crafted, like, like maybe it's focusing on the art, the, the, how it's the artistry of how it's being told, or it's focusing on the novelty of the, the your thoughts about your life or the, the sort of interesting perspective on your life or like putting together in weird, like, here 
I think part of the thing that's happening is she's not really getting this chronological thing. She's going back and forth. Did you notice that the, the, the stuff that it, there's this chronological line that it goes from like 2015, 2014, there's some of the chapters are, have a date and they go from 2014 to 2017. And those sections have a white background. Hmm. Hmm. And then there, it alternates with these sections that are either talking about her, sometimes they're talking about her past, like the, the section with the, the Mormon teacher. And I always love the moments, Patrick, when I'm reminded that you too came from Utah. Yes. Um, yeah, Utah power. Um, but then, and, or there are things like, so talking about India, talking about, so there are either like moments of like, like I think the, the, the moment with the woman is, yeah, like that's one of the black sections. So they're like mini essays about that somehow relate. So there's this movement from 2014 to 2017 that embraces the rise of Trump, but also the growth of her son. And, and so there's this like through line there. And then it's weaving in with these like mini essays that somehow inform it. But like, you can't really say that the, like, the focus of this is the facts of Mira Jacobs' life. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I th what I was going to say the difference as a, as a non-publisher um, is that you can only have one definitive autobiography, but you can have potentially infinite memoirs. Um, and I, I feel like memoir is often looking back on your life to inform your current moment. And like this book, I, I had the, the format I read in had a, white background behind every page. Oh. So there was like the page might have been in gray, but then there's a white background beyond that. Um, so I didn't see that, but it, it informs my perspective on this and that like, I, I feel like maybe she's telling like a 2014 to 2017 present narrative and then using her life to inform how she's perceiving that narrative. And so it's a memoir of like these past three years and this is how my life has informed it. But like, she might come back in 20 years and the white pages will be great pages informing what she's doing now. Yeah. Like to bring it back to Mariah Carey again, because I always think she <laughs> to do that. Like, I think reading a, a, like a list of facts about her would not make me more obsessed and devoted to her. But after reading that memoir, like my fanhood has elevated to a whole new, possibly scary level. So so that's the thing that happened. Um, like there was a part where she was, I guess she routinely collaborates with this producer, David Morales. And I love those remixes of her songs that she does. But then you find out, oh, that also had like a kind of special significance to her. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. Now I feel like we're closer together in a way that an autobiography would not have done. Like I feel, cl I know that's a weird thing to say. I realize saying that now, but it's a parasocial relationship. It's okay, Patrick. I do. I do. Happens okay. happens to the best of us. Yeah, me and Mimi. We're, anyway, <laughs> and not every not every memoir is going to do that, but like I think that's I think you could say this about this as well. Like we don't know the facts of Mary Jacob, but we get an we get insight into her, and yeah. she's, yes. she's inviting us into like a like I think a well done memoir is powered by the thematic rel uh, relevance uh, and sort of asks bigger questions uh, that like, yeah, this isn't about history. It's about these like big questions. And feelings, you might say a memoir is a good talk. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, maybe we should give our scores once again. Oh my God! It's nine thirty. Yeah, it sure as fuck is. Yeah. I, I kind of I, 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 I and mean, we we have to be done. But I, like I, I had this like I'm, I'm a secret interest in like the that arc of it and the fact that like that nine eleven happens right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because I think like I'm just thinking. I was thinking about the, why that was, and I'm like. To be 
a woman of color in America, like there's going to be like, like within this book, there are two like huge holes, like defining like sort of traumatic moments. And I think one of them would be that 9-11 and how that brought up race in America and, and we sort of reinvigorated the discussion of race in America, but also then the election of Trump. So I feel like <clears throat> there's a way in which 9-11 and the election of Trump are both like huge, huge moments, but I don't know. No, I, I, I saw that in the questions and like, I was thinking about it and like, I mean, I was a straight white man in 2001. So like, um, perspective bonkers but um i feel like that was a moment when like america's relationship with race became more explicit and like i feel like that as this book talks about kind of a, a an evolving relationship with race and kind of the small questions and the big questions and the nuances therein i feel like that serves as a really useful turning point for making the book more explicit about the the meanings of that and and what it means to have good talks about race yeah yeah do you want to start us off jeff with your score yeah i i as always the i give the discussion a 10 uh i i actually like i it it rejuvenated like my it made uh, reminded me even more why I like it. So I, I maybe I'll stick with a nine point five, but like inch it upwards nine point seven five. No, I give it a ten. I love it. I love it. I love the art. I love the subject. I love the way she does it. I, it really like I made me realize how smart she is with the way she's structuring the whole thing, but also the way she's structuring each essay and her use of humor, but the opening up, like I would, I, I feel like I could teach any one of the chapters in this to a class on creative writing and it would be, there's like so much to learn from it. So I think it's really brilliant. 10. Oh, and I'll give it, oh, and I'll pass it over to uh, Juniper, because again. Yeah, me twice. Yeah. Um, You're right to my right. So I gave it a 7.5 to 8, so 7.75. I can do math. Um, and I thought the conversation was really brilliant, um, and it really quelled some of the the stumbling blocks I had with the story and really um, I feel like I have a stronger appreciation for the narrative intelligence of the author of Mary Jacob. Um, and the, the narr narrative feels, the narrative and the art both feel significantly tighter and more intentional than they did when I before the discussion, and admittedly, I was seventy five percent through, so and, and still I'm, um, and um, I, I feel after talking about it that the book is has a lot more to say, and, and not that I was like. not recognizing that it had a vast depth of things to say, um, but that I feel like it had even more to say than I was recognizing um, in, in that way that like, I see, I see this book in a better way. Um, and I recognize this, this talk as a gooder talk, um, if I may. Um, oh, you may. <laughs> um, and and yeah, I, I, I feel significantly more strongly about this book after discussion than before discussion. Um, and I, I'm going to just give it a 10. Uh, we can couch and say 9.5, but I really, I feel very strongly about this book and it, it might be an emotional extra 0.5, but 
I am very happy this book was on the book club list. So thank you. Um, and to follow Jeffrey's form, um, Oliver. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I, first of all, I just want to say I rate this, uh, this book a 10 out of, or I'm sorry, the, the discussion, I want to rate a 10 out of 10. The discussion was really fucking good. Um, I feel like there's so many books where we like, it's like 815 or 830 and we just like run out of things to say about it. Um, which absolutely did not happen with this book. Um, like it's nine, almost nine thirty right now. Um, so the discussion gets like a solid ten out of ten for me. Um, and the discussion raises my score as well. Um, it was an eight point five, but I'm gonna bring it back up to uh, a nine. Um, you know, I still have some you know minor quibbles about the artwork, but um, you know they're they're more nitpicks than anything else. Ultimately, um, I, I think it was very good and very thought provoking, and um, I think it was it was a very good read. So yeah, uh, Patrick, um, I think I will uh, put my final score at a seven. Let's call it an eight which I think might be a record in terms of jumps with this group. <laughs> so take a note. Um, I really appreciate the discussion, particularly the art and like offering these, all of you offering these perspectives that I should know about since I took art history in high school and we talked about Barbara Kruger. So why didn't I remember her 20 years later, um, <laughs> which is very helpful. So. Um, Keith and Lucy and Kat, maybe Keith can turn into a cat, but, Proceed. Keith, turn into a cat right now. Do it. <laughs> it worked. Oh. Uh, anyway. <laughs> that's more impressive than the pigeon. <laughs> How the uh, fuck did you do that, Juniper? What is what is this witchcraft? <laughs> did, the reactions, did, if you click on reactions. Yeah. Reactions? What the fuck? <laughs> Who's the boomer now? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm boomer. Hey, mm. hey, look at oh. me. I'm the boomer now. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll raise my score up uh, to an eight. You know, I, I feel like there's some more intentionality. Um, I think that <laughs> Patrick talked about uh, um, maybe the medium or perhaps some other form. But, uh, I, I still feel like that's an issue. I mean, like, I definitely enjoyed and would recommend this book. Um, I can't recommend it to my family because there's actually a story in it that actually, uh, I forgot to, Dart, I didn't mention this, but my sister was dating someone from Pakistan and was dating him for years and he never acknowledged her to his family. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like, this is her, his roommate for years. Um, oh, it's so awkward. Yeah, so it's like, oh man, that you know, they they would never they they would read that and be like, yeah, no, just like throw it across the room because of it's uh, too sore of a subject. But yeah, no, but but other than that particular in, uh, anecdote, you know, it's it's uh, I really enjoyed reading it. So uh, thank you for uh, recommending. And loose? Uh, I need to finish it. That's all. I just was out of finish it. It was a really good discussion, though. Um, oh, also, one thing I wanted to ask real quick is, did anyone feel the book should have been longer? Me, I did. Obviously. Apparently, I did. Okay. A little bit. Not terribly. I wanted to go to Florida with them. See who else treated her like the help. Don't we all? Don't we all want to go to Florida right no. now? No. <laughs> no. No. All right, I'll select Mike Prime. First, I gotta say that if we were all together in a room talking about this book, we would have been kicked out of the coffee house an hour and a half ago. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm the talking. Um, I'm legit kind of glad we're not at Java Java Hut anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take it up to a 10. I, I just thought, you know, the, the discussion really made me appreciate aspects of the book that I hadn't realized. So 
uh, well, well worth a, a good read. And it's such a joy to have uh, a book like this to talk about. I, I do kind of, I'll have to admit, I do kind of get tired of uh, some of the um, less um, discussion worthy books. We, we, I feel like we have a lot less of those than we used to. We do. We're doing much better than we used to. It's because we get to pick our favorites. Hell yeah. It's also because we don't require a comic uh, superhero book every other month. That as well. Uh, Jolie, you haven't gone yet, right? I have not, no. So I'll, I'll select Jolie. Oh, okay, great. I just want to say thank you to Keith Cat for trusting us enough <laughs> to show us your butthole. <laughs> thank you, Keith Cat. You know what? Maybe one day all of you will earn my trust enough that I'll show you my butthole. How many bitcoins? You should consider yourselves so lucky. Oliver start... always offering us things that we don't want. We're going to start sewing this trust. You know what? Speak for sure yourself, Jilly. Speak for time. yourself. I am speaking Jolie's for speaking myself. speaking for me too, don't worry. Okay, sweet. Okay. I vote for Jolie. She can speak for me as well. I, you so, know what? I'm tired of these hateful attacks. <laughs> just, give us, just give us imagery of your cats and we're good. We're good. We don't need to see your butthole. I, wasn't, I sure wasn't expecting seeing, you know, Keith Keith's orange butthole, but, you know, it was there. Um, and I just want to say, I trust you too. <laughs> um... <laughs> I gave this book a seven and a half, I think. Yeah, I gave it a 7.5. I, uh, I honestly gave it a 7.5 so I could raise it to like a nine later. <laughs> yeah, like to give it a really high score. I know Juniper's not going to like that one, but I know Jeff does. Um, Power move. Yeah, I... Um, I want to get. I want to give the discussion questions an eleven out of ten. Um, yeah, it just it it made me. This book made me think about a lot of things that I forgot to think about, and will make me continue to think about and uh, to think about those things that I forgot to think about, and to keep reminding other people of those things that they forget to think about too. And it's also given me sort of tools uh, to help kind of have good talks, to continue to have good talks instead of having angry, <laughs> angry blackout red talks, um, which is, you know, which was my, my normal, but now I just, I can't, I can't afford, uh, I can't afford to be angry anymore. I just can only afford, like Mike Fritch, to see past the the lousy bits of my neighbors and to continue to help um, to help them see, like, to see love mm -hmm. <laughs> by loving the better parts of them. And that's it. Even if they don't want to wear a mask, whatever. Show up anyway. Yeah, you gotta, you have to, um, because maybe that's what they're missing. Maybe that's what they're really crying out for. And even if they're not, you, like continue to show, <laughs> yeah. but not your butthole. Yeah, uh, Julie, it, it takes sometimes a while for that approach to pay off. I, I yeah, there's this woman at work who's just like a piece of work. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I just made her like a personal project to just be kind and nice to her. And slowly she started to thaw out and start, started to be a little more kind herself. It was just mm. for years though. I mean, I'm talking like five, six, seven years. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was once that horrible, horrible bitch. Like, and it took a little, it just took some, sometimes it takes five years. Sometimes it takes like just straight up reminding from somebody who, who they have identified or who I, in this case, identified as caring about me to remind me, Hey, you're being a little bit unreasonable or why would you say something like, why, why is it that you think that way? Tell me, I care to know, and I'm not going to be adversarial about it. I am genuinely curious about your opinion. And that's how I kind of try to approach everything. 
It's like, I once was angry and stupid and I probably still am about some things and maybe I need to see why some people are angry and stupid about some stuff. And because there's got to be a reason why you get behind a racist and I need to know why more than I need to hate you. It seems and it's, it's super hard, but that seems really it seems so true. It's I mean I guess at the end the heart of it that there's like making an argument for empathy. Like mm-hmm. even like to have empathy for people who seem like assholes or idiots. Like and if we say no, they're not. They're like they're not. They just there's a genuinely different set of values that are being in in play. Like everyone has a reason. Everyone to circle back. Everyone's a protagonist of their own narrative. Mm-hmm. I will say, I will say. And yeah, it's a good thing to empathize with people who have different beliefs than you. Sometimes, in some situations, you are never going to convince people to not be racist. And the best strategy is to just create an environment in which they do not feel socially comfortable to express and act upon their bigoted views. Yeah. Does anyone else hear that singing? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, hey guys. Carol is singing. That's me. Oh, I was gonna say, does somebody have carolers? Also, I'm Mike Michael, you, Mike okay, L., you didn't vote. Waiting. What's your what's your score? What's your score, Mike? My score of the, the conversation is ten out of ten. But I haven't read the book. Sorry guys. You gotta read the book and let us know. Okay, I will. <laughs> You like okay, it. good. Sorry, but the fact I, that I'm working at Saturday on Saturday night at nine forty just tells <laughs> how busy my month has been. It's crazy. All right, here's what we're gonna do, Mike. We're gonna find your boss. We're gonna go to their house. Okay, we're gonna go have to we're gonna have the Louisville Slugger with us. <laughs> this is we're not a good talk. Him out of the window. That's not a good talk. <laughs> That's not, not a good talk. talk. It really depends on your point of view. <laughs> I do um, want to say that, like, I, I started reading this book at 5.15 today, which was part of, like, why I didn't finish and why my score was, like, less informed than it might have been. Um, and I, I really almost just, I'm like, it's 350 pages, so I'm not going to get through it. And I almost didn't pick it up. But I'm like, these look, it looks like it'll be relatively quick. And I'm so fucking glad I did because this is one of the best discussions of this book club I've ever been a part of. And it is... I can't think of a book club that has approached this one for empathy and humanness. And so I want to thank you all for being a part of it because it's been one of the best discussions that I've ever been a part of. Oh, this book club. oh yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for picking this book to like prompt this discussion. Thanks you guys for reading it. Anyway.